Thank you to the Foundation for having me here. And of course, it's a great pleasure to follow up from Antonio's um, talk. So I've been asked to say a few things about the link between the body and self. And of course, Antonio gave an excellent introduction into that topic. And I'm coming from the perspective of psychology and cognitive neuroscience. And it is true that modern psychology has always seen the body as a starting point for a science of the self. And to a very large extent, the focus was on how we perceive the body from the outside, uh, as when we recognize ourselves in the mirror, an ability that we share with some other non-human primates. And it is considered to be a, a foundational point in the development of the self. In neuroscience, we're also using bodily illusions to try and model how the brain is using sensory information from touch, from vision, to create an online representation of one's own body, the feeling that this body belongs to me. And these kind of advances have been quite influential in giving us a good understanding of how the brain creates a sense of body ownership, a sense of agency, of control over one's own body, uh, and with important implications about how we relate to others, and technological implications on how people can experience themselves in virtual reality environments. So these are some papers that have dealt with the question of body ownership, trying to find out what is the neural network implicated in that, what is the neural network implicated in feeling control over one's own actions. And as I said, you know, these kind of insights have been very important in developing virtual reality environments and giving to people a sense of presence of being then and there. Now, notwithstanding these advances, I think we have been ignoring another side of embodiment, what we would call the interoceptive body, the body as experienced from within. And that concerns sensations such as your heartbeats, your gut feelings, your respiration. And as Antonio has been saying for many, many years, these are crucial for ensuring the stability of the organism, for homeostasis. And it is a question for me, you know, how do we understand the impact of these visceral inputs to the brain? You know, this is a very old idea in physiology, going back to Sherrington, but it has seen a lot of advance over the last few years. In 99, Antonio, with the feeling of what happens, was one of the main first people who talked seriously about homeostatic states and how these give rise to a very basic sense of self. Eventually, that will give rise to consciousness as we understand it. Now, if you look at what is happening in the field, there is an exponential increase in papers covering interoception over the last 10 years. And now we know that interoception or deficits in how the brain is processing information from the body is implicated in a series of mental and physical health conditions, as well as in decision making, emotion recognition, emotion regulation, time perception, and self-consciousness in general. Just to give you an example of how we can more mechanistically study the impact of interoceptive signals, on every single heartbeat, you have a, a cardiac systole phase and a cardiac diastolic phase. And for example, we can time lock the presentation of visual stimuli at different phases of the cardiac cycle and see how this impacts cognitive processing. Now, we know, for example, from the work of uh, Catherine de Lombaudry in Paris that spontaneous fluctuations and the amplitude of a cortical signature of cardiac afferents, the heartbeat evoked potential, influences the way you would perceive consciously or not visual stimuli. Mm. The same goes for how we process emotional stimuli, such as fearful faces. Presenting these stimuli at systole as opposed to diastole will amplify the intensity by which you perceive the stimuli and will actually enable them to break through into consciousness faster. And finally, we have shown how these same processes may explain some of the ways in which we process social information, especially in case of high arousal, especially in cases where some kind of social stereotypes, such as the association between black people and threat, may hijack the physiological mechanism of the body. Now, the argument is quite similar to what Antonio has been saying. First and foremost, we are based machines. And unlike what Descartes thought, that you know, we are different from animals, I think the very reason why we have the kind of conscience we have is because we have this uh, interoceptive body and the fact that almost all of our cognition is driven by this process of ensuring homeostasis. And we can do that in many ways, and one of the most important ways in which we do that is by making predictions about the future state of our bodies and taking appropriate actions to ensure that the future state of the body will be appropriate for survival 
But once we ensure survival, it is, of course, important to think about the well-being of the organism. So it is, it is because of having that body that we have that kind of consciousness. Now, we have been talking about how we translate this idea of homeostasis from a purely physiological level to a more psychological one. So how, how can we mentalize homeostatic states and the very function of homeostasis? And the argument would be that if homeostasis at the physiological level ensures the stability of the organism, if that is the primary purpose of interoception, being aware of interoceptive states at the psychological level is quite important for ensuring the stability and the unity of the self. And what I mean by unity, I mean that we're not just two-dimensional surface bodies. We're filled with visceral organs that give rise to feelings and affect, and that are quite important for bringing together different aspects of our self-experience. And secondly, stability in the sense that interoceptive awareness may provide some kind of resilience to the information that comes from the outside environment. And quite often, this outside environment is other people. And quite often, we have to figure out how other people impact on us and what are the boundaries between ourselves and others. And that is quite important for understanding a series of different mental health conditions. And we're trying to think about this hypothesis, how it plays out in the ways in which we integrate information about ourselves from different sources, from the outside and from within, via our interactions with other people. So it is also important in how social relationships, not just the sentience that Antonio is talking about, but also the sociality of the human brain depends upon how we process informations, information about how other people make us feel. And lastly, and more crucially, we have to think quite carefully about how this ability to become aware of one's own body from within develops in early life, because that will have implications about how we think about the role of interoception for mental health in general. Now, Antonio has this very interesting concept of risk to self, and I just reverse it here to think a little bit about the self being at risk and think about challenges and opportunities if we think about the future. And I want to finish by thinking about the elephants in the room and how many elephants we had in this room over the last two days. And I counted at least two. One of the elephants is what I would call loneliness, and that is very much tied to the question of sociality. And loneliness is becoming a quite substantial, important epidemic. And I think one of the challenges that we'll have to face in the future is what is the impact of loneliness on mental and physical health and how we can think about the technologies we're discussing to mitigate some of these risks. And the second elephant is affect and feelings. You know, we talked about cognition, we talked about neurotechnologies, we talked about connectome, about genes, about drugs, but most of what is going wrong with most of the people who seek some kind of treatment, either because of mental health reasons, but also what goes wrong in many of the neuropsychiatric conditions has to do with feelings and has to do with how people actually experience themselves in relations to others. So let me just sum up with some ideas. I mean, people have been thinking about social robots as one solution to the big question of loneliness, especially for an aging population. And, you know, we, we can think about this kind of hard robots that will be interacting with aging population, or we can think about soft robotics along the, si along the lines of what Antonio has been so interestingly proposing, robots that will have some kind of similar properties to the ones we have in terms of the vulnerability and the risk dimension. And the second interesting thing is about the kind of techno technologies we are developing to complement the affective experience that we have or the interoceptive experience of our own bodies. And of course, you're all aware of the quantified self and all the gadgets, devices, wearables that we have to measure all sorts of variables about our physiological functioning. You know, from the steps, the number of steps you take, your glucose levels, your heartbeats, you name it. And the question is, what do we actually achieve by giving to people this kind of explicit information, not a first-hand experience of how they feel, but a readout of what their bodies are doing? And the one question is whether we're actually turning them into some kind of very anxious accountants where they're just going through the spreadsheets <laughs> trying to figure out whether they're actually doing the right number of steps or whether the heart rate is appropriate or not.
Now, one alternative approach would be to think of wearable technology that, is, that it is a bit more embodied, embedded, and empathic. Embodied in the sense that, you know, it deals with the body not in terms of quantifying the body, but in terms of enabling you to actually experience your body differently and embed it in your daily life and empathic in the sense that you can enter into a kind of dialogue. I think one interesting approach to that is a company called Doppel, which is based in London, and Joy Venture, the company that Miri is leading, has been investing, and we have been working with them, and it's a very interesting, simple design and product where it doesn't measure anything, but it does allow, it does allow you to feel a heartbeat on your wrist, and you can control the frequency and intensity of the heartbeat, and you can use this kind of salient, very big use biological rhythm of experiencing heartbeat to actually regulate your mood, to upregulate it or downregulate it, depending on the frequency of the heartbeat. And we have been doing some studies to see what are the effects on people's levels of arousal uh, in different kind of settings. Now, the last thing is about effective computing. And there's a lot of hype about machine learning and the ability to decode emotions and let people know what they're actually feeling. And I have problems with that, because the science does not support that idea. First of all, a lot of us are quite poor at recognizing our emotions or labeling our emotions. Secondly, you know, the evidence for unique near field physiological fingertips or specific emotions is rather weak, and the experience of emotions or of these near physiological changes depends largely on context. So I'm not so sure whether we can actually achieve that, and even if we think that we can do that, what are the implications for the experience of the self? Especially if you're not good at recognizing what you're actually feeling or labeling your emotion. What is happening when somebody comes and tells you, you know, the kind of experience you have, you know what you're feeling? What you're feeling is anger or anxiety. And what are the consequences of giving that kind of label? And whether, you know, it's a wearable or whether it is Trump, who says to the electorate, you must be very angry, what are the consequences of that kind of process is for me one of the challenges that we'll be facing and potentially one of the negative consequences of wearable devices. And lastly, you know, we have to think about what's the political dimension of this question of the body, the self and emotions. I have been involved in a, in a flagship report that was commissioned by the European Commission to think about drivers of political behavior other than rational decision making. And one of the most important dimensions that we examined was the role of emotions. We're not just rational decision makers, we're influenced by our emotions, and the more we think about how emotions take part into our everyday life, our decision making, the more I think we will gain about, probably the most important insight will be to understand why it is so important to make people emotionally literate. And this is not trivial, and probably we will need to think about more radical technologies that will enable people to actually experience their own bodies rather than just measure their experience. So the discussion about what the next brain would be like cannot be actually dissociated from the very experience of being an embodied self at risk. Thank you very much.